Hi, we're live. We're broadcasting live from the American Academy of Dermatology's summer meeting. I'm Kara Jillick. I'm the social media manager for the Academy, and we're really excited to have Dr. Doris Day with us today. She is the clinical associate professor of dermatology at NYU Langone, and she is has a private practice here in New York. Thanks for being here with us today. Oh, I'm so excited to do this with you, Kara. Thanks for having me. So we're excited to talk about taking care of your skin in the summer, which we both admitted is our favorite season. Um, so to start things off, if you can give us a couple of your top tips for taking care of your skin in the summer. Yeah, it's true. Summer really is my favorite time of year. And it's we can be dermatologists and love summer, even love the sun and love our time outdoors. So I always encourage my patients to be physically active and to spend time outdoors, but it's so important to be sun smart. And that's my first quiz question for you. What does sun smart mean to you? And I'll give you the answers as we go along, but feel free to type it in with your questions as we go along with this Facebook Live session. Tips that I have in terms of how to protect and how to enjoy summer and keep your skin as clear and healthy as possible. Of course, it's about using sunscreen every day, being sun smart, that's critical. Also change up your products. In the winter, it's drier, there's more wind, and you need to protect your skin with heavier, richer moisturizers, products, and even heavier makeup. In the summer, you don't necessarily have to go that heavy. So we'll talk a little bit about how to change those products and what I like and what I recommend for that. Also, go bigger in your sunglasses because I want you to protect more around your eyes. The sun affects your skin, but it can affect your eyes as well. And our most deadly skin cancer, melanoma, can also occur in the eyes. So I want you to protect your eyes and around your eyes too. Also look for fun clothing. We'll talk about the different colors of clothing and different fabrics and how that affects your skin because sometimes people think that if they just wear a t-shirt, they're automatically completely protected and it's just not true. T-shirt and clothing have sun protection or ultraviolet protection factors as well and different colors, different fabrics have different amounts of protection. So much to cover. Great, great. Great tips to start. Um, so maybe let's first start talking about sunscreen. And that's an important tool, protecting your skin. What, what should people look for when they're choosing a sunscreen? And how do they make sure that they're using it properly? There are so many sunscreens available out there. I mean, I walk up and down the drugstore aisle and I marvel at all the product choices that we have. And what this means is that there's no one sunscreen that's perfect for everyone. There's also a variety of SPF options, and people sometimes wonder if I go higher in SPF, am I more protected? And you have to be a little bit careful because an SPF number is a number that's determined in a laboratory, and that's my second quiz question. So write these down and put your answer down, is how soon before going out do you need to apply your sunscreen? So that answer is going to come. Well, should we save that for a little bit from now? Sure. Okay. <laughs> or we'll answer it more than once. But I, my answer to my patients and what I would tell you is that as long as you're using sunscreen that's an SPF 30 or higher, one that says broad spectrum on it, then you're going to be okay in terms of your sun protection. There's creams, wipes, lotions, sprays, gels, pads, you know, cloths. There's so many ways to get your sun protection. If you're more active and you sweat more, you might look for a gel sunscreen, one that says water resistant, because um, there's no more waterproof or sweat resistant, but there's no more sweat proof. Those things have had to go out of the equation because we realize that that gives a false sense of security about what they can really do. So look for an SPF 30 or higher, but when these are tested, they're tested in a laboratory. So that SPF number is very specific and it is not usually what people are using in the real world. Nobody uses quite as much as they do in the laboratory to test. So one thing that I do when I apply my sunscreen to my face and what I think you should try is put it from the outside of the face towards the center and always get the sides of the neck as well and the ears. And the reason for this is, is that most people, when you put it on the middle of your face, you get the middle and then you kind of run out as you get to the edges. But I see so much sun damage and a lot of skin cancer on the borders of the face and kind of right between the eyes and on the upper lip. That's where sunscreen tends to wear off quickest and also where people don't necessarily have enough to apply. So if you start from the outside 
and work towards the middle, you have a much better chance of getting adequate coverage. And you'll usually find that you have to go back and get a little bit more product, which people will do because they always want to protect their nose. Yeah, that's a great tip. Um, I just want to make sure someone had commented earlier that there wasn't volume, but it seems like that other people can hear. So if, uh, if there's any sound issues, let us know, but hopefully that's, that's been worked out. Um, related to, and also I just want to encourage people to ask questions. Um, we have some questions that people asked ahead of time and we're going to get to those, uh, but we'd love to hear from you and, and hear what you want to have Dr. Doris Day answer today. Um, D Melissa Melly had given us some questions ahead of time that relate to sunscreen and choosing a sunscreen. So she asked about what SPF level do you recommend and do you recommend the same SPF if you use it in a, in a moisturizer? So anything that has an SPF label on it is a sunscreen. So whether you call it a moisturizer with SPF or an SPF that's just any other SPF, a powdered gel, spray, cream, anything that we mentioned, they're all tested the same way. And they, to have that SPF label on the bottle or tube, it has to go through certain testing to get that. The difference between a moisturizer with SPF and just any other sunscreen is how much you apply. So if you apply a moisturizer, but you don't apply a lot of product because you only need a little bit of moisturizer, then chances are that's not enough. Anything is going to work as long as you apply it the right way, and then you also have to reapply it every few hours, otherwise it wears off. So I'll give the answer to the first quiz question that I asked, which was how soon before, well, that's actually the second quiz question. Mm -hmm. We'll do the second one first. How soon before you go out do you need to apply your sunscreen, whether it's a moisturizer or any other sunscreen? And the answer is about 15 minutes. And the reason for this is that it takes a little while for it to just dry on your skin and also to get full coverage. So if you wait till you get to the beach to apply your sunscreen, then you've already had all that exposure. Because the second you walk out the door and those UV rays hit your skin, they're starting to accumulate the UV damage to the skin, which breaks down collagen, causes specific DNA damage that ultimately leads to skin cancer. So I want you protected from before you walk out that door. Now the other part of that, so it's a little bit of a trick question. The other part of that is how effective is that sunscreen once you apply it to the skin? And the answer is that it's effective right when you apply it. When they do the testing in the laboratory, they don't apply and wait a certain amount of time. They apply it and then they test it right away, but they have full coverage. So that 15 to 20 minutes is really not for how quickly it takes to be activated because it's already active. It's how long I want you to apply it or the AAD recommends that you apply it to make sure that you have full coverage, that it's dry in your skin, you're not gonna rub it off before you go out. And that's where that confusion sometimes comes from because there's all sorts of numbers I've heard out there and I had to go back to the scientists and ask them the question, the, the PhDs who are actually making these products in the labs, to see what the answer to that was. So apply it before you go out. You want to be completely covered, have it completely dry, but just have that confidence that once it's applied to your skin, you know it's active. And then should we do the, the other quiz question mm -hmm. about SunSmart? So what do you think SunSmart means, or what does it mean to you? The way mm -hmm. I call SunSmart is meaning that sunscreen is only one tool, one little tool in your toolbox of protecting your skin against the damaging UV rays. The other tools are things like trying to avoid midday sun when you can. And I'll tell you about the shadow rule coming up, but trying to avoid midday sun when you can, staying in the shade when you can, um, wearing a hat with a broad brim that's gonna really cover your face. That helps a lot, that's your own personal shade looking for sun protective clothing. There's lots of clothing that has ultraviolet protection factor built in, and that can give you the confidence that any area that's protected by that clothing has better protection than any topical sunscreen will give you, and it's reliable and lasting. It doesn't wear off as sunscreen does. So wearing ultraviolet protective clothing, and a lot of this clothing is, um, is very fashionable and not even mm -hmm. more expensive than, than general clothing. So look for that if you can. And then knowing the shadow rule to avoid midday sun. So the shadow rule is when your shadow is shortest, which is gonna be at noon, right? So when you look up, the sun's right above you, you look down, of course you're gonna have no shadow. 
that's when those UVB rays are the strongest and most likely to make you burn. So that's when you really want to be extra careful to have physical protection, stay in the shade, reapply your sunscreen more often, and, um, and be sun smart in that way. <clears throat> I feel like I go on tangents. I start something and then I go off somewhere else. So you can bring me <laughs> it's back all around. Good tips. I hope you guys are writing them down. <laughs> um, another question about sunscreen from Melissa was what SPF level, is there a different SPF level you recommend for kids? Are there any oh, ingredients yeah. to look for? That's good. And that brings <laughs> around to that SPF number. So below an SPF of 15, most you can't even make the claim that it does anything beyond avoid a sunburn. So SPF below 15 isn't what the American Academy of Dermatology, which represents us as the largest group of dermatologists. And so they have the opinions of a broad spectrum of, of incredibly smart scientists and, and uh, providers who see patients on a daily basis. And we, we see what the, the havoc that the sun can wreak on the skin. So go SPF 30 or higher. That's really the point there, um, 30 or higher. Now, when you get above 50, the benefit is less... Uh, less obvious. Um, I personally recommend a higher SPF when you can find it, but if you go 30, we're happy. That's the AD recommendation. That's our number that we start with. That's our line in the sand. Don't go below 30. Above 50 can become a little bit more questionable, but the reality is that because most people aren't applying enough. Now for kids, depending on the age, above six months, I, and, and really children in general, like I would say, five is just a random number. I, I prefer the physical protection, the zinc and the titanium. And a lot of the difference between children's sunscreen and adult sunscreen is just packaging. We try to make it so that it's more interesting for the kids to like the packaging and want to apply it to their skin. But really the sunscreen ingredients are the same for children and adults. The differences might be subtle. Something in the formulation like a fragrance or a preservative might be somewhat different, but that if your child isn't allergic to the fragrance or preservative, there's no reason to choose one over the other. So if you have a family sunscreen, then that's fine for children. Below six months, just because of the difference in body surface area to volume ratio and questions about absorption, we generally say to use physical protection and clothing. So if you use zinc and titanium in their regular formulation, not micronized, they don't get absorbed into the skin. It's almost like wearing a layer of clothing on your skin. Um, and I do recommend for children to have sun protective clothing as much as possible, hat and sunglasses. Mm -hmm. And for the moms who say that my child won't wear it, then I, my thing is that my kids, when we were growing up, it's like, you don't wear it, we don't go out, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and yep. kids wanna go out. So mm -hmm. they, they listen, you're the mama. We buy the hats with the Stra you know, straps yes. to keep it on. So it right. doesn't keep and pulling it off. Uh -huh. yeah. Those yeah. are the best. <clears throat> yeah, so the, those tips of avoiding the midday sun and wearing sun protective clothing, those apply to kids also and probably are the, a better way than having to, you know, wrestle them to put sunscreen on if, if you right. can use those methods. And kind um, of make it fun. Let, let your child apply sunscreen <laughs> to you and then you apply it to your children. And a lot of parents will come back with sunburns and suntans and they say, well, I'm just running around after my kids all day and I don't have time to apply it to me. So I kind of think of that airline thing where they say if the oxygen mask mm -hmm. comes down, put it on you first. Mm -hmm. um, put it on yourself before you go out reapply it for yourself. One is it really sets a good example for your children, yeah. for them to see you, to apply it to yourself. And two is, you know, your, your children need to be engaged in the process. So let them, you can do it at the same time. You can do it for each other and kind of try to make it as fun as possible. But it's, it's something just like wearing your seatbelt. It, it should be as important to you to, you know, you have that car seat, you wear your seatbelt, you have to wear your sunscreen. It's, it's, it is protection and it, ultimately can be a difference between life and death with some of the skin cancers that we see. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have a couple more on sunscreen and then we can move on to a, a different topic. Um, so we got a question asking about that, saying that they always get acne after using sunscreen. So what, how can that be prevented? What can they look for? That is a good question. <clears throat> there are sunscreens that are made specifically for acne prone skin. So you can look for ones that say non-comedogenic or non-acnegenic, that helps. I also find that the gel versions of sunscreen, so sunscreen gels, the sports block gels tend to do better for acne prone patients and also the powder sunscreens. If you use sunscreen, 
it's also important to make sure you wash it off well at the end of the day. You might want to do a gentle exfoliation and or just use a, a little bit more of a cleansing scrub to make sure you get that sunscreen off. Um, the, the sun will cook the water out of your skin. So many of my patients with acne feel that their skin is better after some sun exposure because it hides the red. But in the long run, the sun actually makes your pores bigger, makes the oil glands overgrow, which is what makes your pores look bigger and can lead to acne. So the sun is not a solution for people who are acne prone. I know that wasn't your question, but I just thought I'd throw that in too. Um, so yeah, look for the sports block gels or a powder. Make sure you wash it off well at the end of the day. And then also use those other sun protective measures. If you're an active person and you're running outdoors or doing other activities, then try to do those earlier and later in the day and still wear sun protection. But that will also help um, work around it. Great. Um, we have another sunscreen related question. She said, Maria says she has very fair skin and went outside recently. She wore sunscreen, a hat, glasses, but had two dark spots on her face the next day. How can she get rid of them? Oh, that's so frustrating. It sounds like you did everything absolutely right. And the sun somehow still finally found your skin. Sometimes with those dark spots, that can be something called melasma. And melasma I see more in my patients who are on hormonal contraceptives for five years or longer. It usually doesn't happen in the first year that they're on that hormonal contraceptive. It, it takes a few years before that starts to um, become a problem. And even just a few minutes on a cloudy day, um, and sometimes just the infrared even, we're, we're learning more and more about what triggers melasma. But I, I wonder if, if the, the caller... Um, if the caller, if the, if the viewer mm -hmm. on, on our Facebook Live is on a hormonal contraceptive, because that can make it a little bit more problematic. But wearing a hat, sunglasses, wearing SPF, reapplying it more, um, and still getting those brown spots is, is very frustrating. I, I can say two things. One is um, it would have been much worse if you didn't have it on. But the other thing, too, is that to lighten it, there are products that help either gently exfoliate and help brighten the skin that your dermatologist can guide you towards that are either prescription or, or over the counter to help brighten those. And lasers can help that too. So there's a lot that we can do to help brighten depending on the source of that. Also, if you get a brown spot or what you think is a sunspot, it's always good to show your dermatologist to make sure that that's all it is. And it's, a, it's a, an excuse to get in to have a skin cancer screening. I have patients who don't like to come in in the summer and have a skin cancer screening because they think that if I don't see the tan, the tan mm -hmm. doesn't count. And that's just not true. <laughs> if I don't see the tan, it still counts. And I have patients who come in with the tan and they, um, and when I obviously point out that they have a tan, I mean, it's kind of obvious that they have a tan. Mm -hmm. um, they'll tell me, but I use sunscreen. And I used to not know how to answer this because they always had a good story too that, you know, I was on vacation, I was on my honeymoon. Like, how can you be upset at someone when they're on their honeymoon, right? And they have a tan. But what I realized and the best answer I come up with, because, you know, as, as dermatologists, as physicians, we don't judge. We're never judging our patients. We're really here to inform and guide and try to keep you as safe as possible. But ultimately, what you have to know is that even if you did everything right, even if you think you applied enough sunscreen and you get a suntan or a sunburn, that still counts. The damage is still being done to your skin. And when I see young patients in their 20s who come in with suntans and sunburns, I, you know, I try to tell them that now that I've been in practice long enough and I see people in their 40s and 50s when they come in and they have the same line over and over and they say, one day my face just fell apart. And they're so unhappy about it. And they say, I wish I could go back and use more sunscreen when I was in my 20s. So I try to tell that 20 year old that your 50 year old self is sitting here telling you, please apply more sunscreen. Because at 20, you're naturally beautiful. You have great genetics and mm -hmm. you have your own natural beauty from youth. At 50, it's work. You know, besides all the skin cancers that we hopefully will never have to remove, but it, it's the, that collagen breakdown, that premature aging, those brown spots, the broken blood vessels, all those things that the sun does, they have, they're harder to repair and they're much easier to avoid than they are to repair. So um, I would just plead with anyone and let you know that there's studies and data that shows that no matter how much sun damage you have, if you start wearing sunscreen, every day, all year round, from today, going forward, 
your skin will do natural repair, your risk of skin cancer will go down by up to 25%, which is a lot, and you'll have less premature aging. So your skin wants to repair, it wants to look its best, and if you just do simple measures, it will it will start to repair now and it will look better later. So, so it's never we're too, here to help you. Never too late to start. It's never exactly too never too late to start. And, and today's a perfect day. If if someone wants to look tan still, do you recommend self tanners or is that something that um, yeah. I think it was safe? the <laughs> American Academy of Dermatology or or another organization that came up with a great line called Perfect Your Pale. <laughs> so I like the idea of perfecting your pale, kind of going with your own glow and, and celebrating your own skin color with some highlights and contours if you want to have a little bit of, of, of color that way. Um, if you really still do want to have a suntan look, then the sunless tanners are the safer way to go. And um, there's lots and lots of options available. So the original ones that were available made you look orange and were streaky, took forever to dry, and they smelled horrible. So now they've come a long way where it's the same active ingredient, but now they've added in bronzers and they've added in other chemicals that can make it glide on more smoothly. And the way to do that, if you want to use a sunless tanner, is to take a shower and exfoliate first. So the smoother your skin is, the more hydrated it is, the better that product will go on because it's really absorbed into the outer layers of the skin and creates a reaction there, which is what gives you the color. So if you have a lot of dry skin and flaking, that's going to create more of an uneven look to the, to the sunscreen product. Also, areas like your elbows and knees and ankles have slightly thicker skin, and so more product will be absorbed there. You might want to put a little bit of Vaseline or a, a product that's going to create a barrier so you don't apply a lot of product there and just go lighter. Also, I like ones that tend to be slower where you apply it and then it gradually gives you color over days. That is also helpful. There are some sunscreens even that have a little bronzer built in. So while you're applying the sunscreen, you get a little bit of color just from the sunscreen product, and that makes you feel like you got a tan, which is probably better than just trying to get the tan. So right. there's lots of tricky ways to get it in. And then um, it helps to moisturize over it. But I have patients who are so used to having a suntan. And then when I see them, to me, they still look incredibly tan. And to everyone else, they look tan. But to their own eyes, they're so used to that super dark look that a tan look to them looks pale and makes them actually feel sad. So we know that tanning can be an addiction and that going to a tanning salon or tanning bed can be even more harmful than getting rays from being outdoors in the sun. So going to a tanning salon is never okay and um, and should not be done. Those light tanning beds, I call them tanning coffins, can be 10 times stronger than natural UV light. Um, and it, you, you have to wean yourself off it, but people get used to that color. They like the feeling. It releases um, hormones that, that you get after like a runner's high and people kind of get addicted to that feeling. So you have to really try hard not to, um, to just to perfect your pale and go as light as you, as close to your own skin color as you can. And that reminds me that for any skin type, doesn't matter what your skin type is, your natural skin tone, every skin type has to protect against UV rays um, because any skin type can get skin cancer. So everybody of every ethnicity needs to, and you know, every age needs to protect against UV rays. And then enjoy your time outdoors. I have to keep saying that because I do like my time outdoors mm -hmm. and I want you to also. <laughs> well, good, let's see um, what other questions we can get to from the audience, um, we still have, a, so it seems like people are very interested in sunscreen, so it's good. All right, I'm good. Um, Sana, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but asked how effective are gel-based sunscreens, which are advised for oily skin, and is it best to use, or is it best to use zinc oxide or titanium oxide-based sunscreens? Well, the, the answer, it, it's a top question in the sense that it comes down to preference. And when you have an underlying problem like acne that you're trying not to flare, then, then your choices become a little bit more limited. So the reality is that as long as you have that SPF number of 30 or higher, you're getting 
ideally, theoretically, right, the same protection if you apply enough of it. So to get that SPF 30 number, you have to apply, you, they have to go through certain testing. And the, I, the reason behind that was the FDA wanted it to be, for the consumer, a sense of equivalence. And that means that when you go to the store, you see SPF 30 across any brand at any price, you know that you're getting the same protection. That applies really to UVB protection, and that's what the SPF number really applies to. In terms of UVA protection, you want to look for broad spectrum. And the FDA is still working on a monograph to say exactly what that continuity is. That's not quite the same across brands, and it's really hard for the consumer, even us as dermatologists, to know exactly what that means. But I would say, for right now, the way I would look at it, and my answer to you is that pick what you like, as long as it's SPF 30 or higher, whether it's zinc and titanium, that physical protection, or if it's the gel, it's all meant to be equivalent. And then as long as it also says broad spectrum, UVA and UVB protection. Once you do that, do that that's the best you can do, and there isn't really more we can know. Okay. Um, I like the sunscreen okay. questions. These are great questions. Another question from Eddie asking, what are your thoughts about sunscreen in a pill? Ah, good question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so sunscreen in a pill is a little bit more tricky. Now, I do believe that you can eat your sunscreen too. That doesn't mean you should go buy your sunscreen and actually eat the, the product, mm -hmm. but that foods and even supplements can have some protection. Never ever to replace the need for the other sun smart measures, but as an adjunct to add it in. And there's data that shows a Mediterranean diet that's one high in antioxidants like olive oil, salmon, uh, green leafy vegetables, colors found in nature. So you pick your color, berries, all those things do give you that antioxidant protection. And when you think about it, it kind of makes sense because plants and these these fruits and vegetables, they grow outdoors in the sun and they're not mobile. So when it gets hot and sunny, they can't move indoors, right? As humans, we're supposed to be smarter. When it gets hot and sunny, we're supposed to move out of danger's way and go in and protect ourselves. Um, so those plants make antioxidants to protect them and also help them thrive in the sun. It's kind of an adaptation of nature. Like think about a cactus. It grows in the middle of the desert in sand with little nutrients and it thrives in that environment and the hot sun beating down on it all day long. So when we eat those foods, we get some of their protection as well, but it will never replace the need to protect from the outside. So I don't mind adding as long as you know, you're know you doing it in a smart way. We know what you're adding in terms of natural foods that will give you that antioxidant protection and some supplements that are available that have data to prove it. Your dermatologist can help you knowing what those are, um, then I think that's fine. As long as you know that if you do that and you don't apply sunscreen, you're gonna burn in the sun and hurt your skin. The skin is such a great organ because we can affect it directly from the outside with sun protection and products that we apply, but it also is affected by what you put in your body. So I think both are, are important. That's a great question, thank you. Good. Um, let's see. Okay. I are sunscreens enriched with beta carotene safe? Or will they cause discoloration? So there are, there are some studies that looked at beta carotene and found that, um, that it doesn't make a difference in terms of actual sun protection. It will make your skin orange. So if you eat a lot of carrot chips, <laughs> your mm -hmm. skin will, will kind of turn orange. And we know that it's not a, a real problem because your eyes, the white of your eyes don't turn yellow. So we know it's not a liver problem, it's just the beta carotene issue. Um, so, I wouldn't use beta carotene as, or think that it gives you any protection against the sun, um, but it's it's fine if you like the color that it makes you, if you apply it to your skin, but okay. no protection from that. Okay. Um, okay. So I think we've answered most of the questions for on sunscreen. Um, another topic or something that you mentioned was changing up your your skincare routine and some of the products that you use from winter going into summer. 
So can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. You know, in the in the winter, you have a heavier wardrobe, and that applies to skin as well, right? Your wardrobe for what you put on your skin might be heavier and richer in the winter. So I like to say when you put away your winter clothing, you can put away your winter products as well for the most part. And um, in the summertime, you can sometimes really just go to a super light hyaluronic acid-based uh, moisturizer or hydrator for the skin. In the summertime, you can, you know, I think of a difference between being, um, between hydration and moisture. So in the winter, you can be dry in your skin and need a richer product. In the summer, you can get dehydrated in general, which also affects your skin. And this happens in two ways. One is you sweat more in the summer, and the other is that um, when you're running and you're more active, you're just losing more water out of your skin that way and you can just get dehydrated. people tend to drink a little bit more in the summer because they're out and they're more social so all that can be dehydrating and the natural hyaluronic acid in your skin which holds water and gives your skin that firmness and plumpness can can lose its water because it gives it up for the rest of the body so drinking water will actually make your skin look better but the outer layers need to be hydrated as well in the winter the outer layers tend to be drier because the air is so cold and dry and windy that dries the outer layers. And so you need to use a richer moisturizer, which you don't necessarily need in the summer. So one, drink more water in the summer, and you can make your water fun by putting lemon slices, cucumber slices. I do this at home and my kids even love it. So it makes them drink more water. Make water interesting and fun to drink. And you can eat your water. Berries have water in them, and salad has water, lettuce has water, cucumbers have water, so many fruits and vegetables are packed with water and fiber. So that's one way to get hydrated besides just drinking water. And then the other is use a lighter moisturizer, more of a lotion or even a gel moisturizer over a heavy, rich, creamy one. Now, as you get older, your skin and your oil glands are naturally less productive. So your skin naturally gets drier and you may still need a cream at night if you're, if you're you know, peri or postmenopausal, that may not apply quite as much to you. And the legs tend to be dry all year round. So you may have to moisturize still a little bit richer on the body, but for the face, you can typically go lighter. Okay. And also know that anything you apply to your hair ends up on your face. And a lot of times when I have patients who think they have a breakout, it's a reaction to a hair product. And those hair gels and hairsprays and dry shampoos, as you go out and you sweat a little bit, if you walk or you're active, all that can end up on your face and cause either a, an acne type reaction or an irritant reaction that can look like acne. So if your breakout is more along the periphery of your face, think about what you're putting in your hair. Maybe use less in the way of hair products in the summer too. That's a good tip. Um, this is a question from McKenya, and she was asking for eating and skincare tips. You talked a little bit about that, um, but specifically food. she said she's 28 African American and has severe eczema and dark spots. So looking for tips there, skincare tips, um, diet. Well, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sorry that you're going through that with the eczema and it, with leaving marks. So one thing I would say, and, and I appreciate your question, is Definitely use sunscreen because the dark spots will absorb those UV rays more and create more of a discoloration in your skin and more uneven skin tone. So sun protection is especially important. Also see your dermatologist because we do have some new treatments for atopic dermatitis, eczema as well. And I would say that if, if you have it and it's severe, as you mentioned, then I think you'll be very happy with some of the new options available that are really truly brand new. So um, hopefully that's helpful for you as well. Hydrating is important. Now, some people with eczema, and I really wanted to bring this point up, so I'm so glad that you asked the question. Some people with eczema are summer eczema flares, and some people have winter eczema flares. Um, and you, you have to kind of see if you're seasonal about it and try to manage it especially carefully around that season. And see if you can figure out what makes it worse for you. But if you're a summer person where eczema is worse in the summer, then see your dermatologist ahead of time so you can have a strategy of how to manage it so you don't end up with the flare and then the dark spots and have to kind of retract and try to treat it and brighten your skin afterwards. Hydrating is really critically important. Having proper water balance in the skin 
getting enough rest, managing your stress overall. Stress is such a general term, but truly learning about how to manage your stress a little bit better can be helpful for a condition like eczema. And um, and yeah, there's, de there's definitely so much that you can do, but I would throw in there that sun protection is especially critical and water balance. Um, eating foods, for um, eczema, I don't know if that was part of the question, but um, but definitely having high antioxidant foods can be helpful. It isn't going to cure it. You know, having eczema is not your fault. It's not something that you did. It's just something that happens and something you have to deal with. But if you can support by having a healthier, more antioxidant, less in the way of simple sugar type of diet, you, you might see that that makes a big difference for you. And she, she had a follow-up, which I think is probably a common problem in the summer um, and if there's anything she can do to manage and improve discoloration. Yes. You know, sun protection is first and foremost from preventing it from getting worse um, or having them more come out. But there are brighteners <laughs> that you can use either that have hydroquinone or that are hydroquinone free that can help brighten those spots. First, you want to make sure that they're not active, that they're just the discoloration left behind. I also like gentle exfoliants. Lactic acid, which you could find over the counter, is a humectant, and it also gently exfoliates. That can help as well, but if you apply it to raw skin or skin that is somewhat irritated, it can sting and burn. So you definitely want to make sure your skin is otherwise healthy and intact, and look for ingredients that can help gently, gently exfoliate and I mentioned lactic acid is one to look for. There's prescription versions of it available as well that your doctor can recommend that will help that skin cell turnover and add hydration in at the same time. Um, and, then, and then the other brightening products that can help as well. Um, below the knee, things take a lot longer to even out in tone than above the knee, just the way circulation goes and the way healing is and the vascularity and, and the, the skin on the lower legs can be the take the longest to heal as much as possible. You know, eczema is really difficult. I think of eczema as an itch that rashes as opposed to, let's say, psoriasis that is a rash that itches. Mm -hmm. And with eczema, what happens is you first have an itch that's so intractable, you can't really help but scratch it. And when you go after it and you scratch it, then the rash comes out and that rash can leave discoloration. But if, as much as possible, if you can prevent the scratching, this, you know, obviously you'll help prevent the rash as much, you know, a little bit too, and um, and that discoloration that follows. Rubbing also creates that discoloration. So hydrating the skin, protecting it, asking your dermatologist about products to treat the eczema and brighten will go a long way for you. Okay, great. Hope that's and of helpful. course, sun protection. Helpful. Yeah. Um, let's see. We have a, a few more questions. Um, Lisa asked us, does using Retin-A really help with wrinkles? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is a great question, too. Oh, and we have to cover vitamin D. We'll get to that one also because mm -hmm. that reminds me, so don't let me forget. Okay. Um, so using Retin-A. So Retin-A, retinoic acid, it's available in lots of forms, prescription and over-the-counter retinols. These are vitamin A or vitamin A derivatives, and they are the most highly published, highly studied ingredients, period. I mean, of anything out there. So we know down to the molecule how they work, and we know that they do make a difference in improving the collagen layer of the skin. And um, and so as dermatologists, me personally, and I know for many of my colleagues, if we recommend one ingredient to help your skin, we recommend retinol, and it's our favorite ingredient through and through. And, and it's still this way 50 years later after it was first published and studied. So it's, it's been around, and some things that have been around are just get better. <laughs> so, um, so I would say yes, it, it's helpful for your skin. Now, what a lot of patients will tell me, well, I, I stopped using it in the summer um, because it's gonna make me more sun sensitive, or I heard it thins out the skin, and both false. So for one thing is it really doesn't thin out the skin, but what it does is it normalizes skin cell turnover. And by doing that, that makes your skin cells mature in a more normal way. And that helps the collagen layer actually become younger, which is usually a little thicker and gives better uh, quality to your skin. That's good, but the outer layer is called the stratum corneum. That's a dead skin cell layer, which people are exfoliating off all day long anyway. And that stratum corneum, if it doesn't sit flat and even, then when the sun hits and reflects, it bounces off the other stratum corneum cells, which can make your skin look dull. And um, with, 
when you're using a retinol, it makes that stratum corneum, that outer dead skin layer, sit flat and more even and more compact, which when the light hits, it reflects synchronously, your skin looks more radiant and less wrinkled. So it's actually very helpful. But if you're very fair skin, you count on that stratum corneum to absorb some UV rays and even to hold in some water. And so without it, it seems like your skin is thinner, but it's really not thinner. So I think this is a great ingredient. I recommend it on a daily basis. It's available in the drugstore, over the counter, in many brands and in prescription form. So there's lots of ways to get it and find it. If you're sensitive to it, if it's drying to your skin, there's other formulations you can look for. You can moisturize over it. I have my patients use it all year round and I don't have a problem with it. And um, it's not an exfoliant. It's promoting normal skin cell turnover. It's working at a molecular level. So it's, I think it's a great ingredient, but you do need to use more sunscreen and you do need to reapply it um, on, a, on a regular basis. So if you're using a retinol, definitely be careful about your sun exposure because of that flattening of that outer, outer layer, but know that it's just because it's on your skin. The reason we use it at night mostly is because it's unstable in light. So if you put it on in the morning, and it hasn't been specifically stabilized, when you go out in the sun, the sun will inactivate it. So mm -hmm. it's more sensitive to sun than, than it would make you. Okay. Yeah. Makes and then sense. the vitamin D thing. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people think that they need vitamin D for sun, uh, or sun for vitamin D mm -hmm. really is what I meant to say. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that you get vitamin D naturally Forget about supplements, which I don't object to, but you get vitamin D naturally from many food sources like fatty fish, some nuts and other foods. So there's lots of ways to get vitamin D without going in the sun. And the sun is probably the least effective way to get vitamin D. There was a study that said that if you took high doses of vitamin D after a sunburn, it helped relieve it. I'm not sure how much I go with that study, but if you look at that, there's lots of data that shows the benefits of vitamin D. Um, I would say one, don't get the sunburn, um, but two is don't count on the sun for it. And then there's lots of foods that are fortified with vitamin D, and that's a much, much more reliable way to get your vitamin D levels. If you're worried that your D levels are low, you can get a blood test that will tell you if, you're, if your D levels are okay or not. And if you need to, you can supplement it in lots of ways. I had someone who once said that she had to go in the sun or to a tanning salon because no matter how much she took, it didn't get her D levels up. And that just means you didn't take enough, that there, there is no such thing, that it, it just doesn't need to come through the sun. You can enjoy the light of the sun. And I finally learned that when patients say, oh, but I love the sun, they mean, I love the sun tan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I came up with the line that if you like being tan, you better love being wrinkled. Um, and then, of course, there's the issue of skin cancer. But for vitamin D, get it through food, get it through natural, through supplements, and don't don't think that the sun is the best or only source. It's really not. Um, let's find another question. This one is from Colleen. She said, "Can store-bought skincare lines be as effective as other higher-end lines if you have a good moisturizer?" Are eye creams and serums necessary? Those are good questions. Okay, great questions. So mm -hmm. I really think I've, I've sort of explored a lot of different brands. I used to work in a research lab. I've helped develop skincare lines. I take ingredients and product lines really, really seriously. And this is a great question because I recommend drugstore brands all day long. And I, I believe that there's really pretty much no excuse to have bad skin anymore because we have so many great options and we have great dermatologists that you can go see anywhere you live across the country. So um, drugstore brands have come a very long way. There are very smart PhDs, scientists working on all aspects of skin care, anti-aging, uh, rejuvenation, protection, and the products that they bring to market are at very reasonable prices. They have ingredients like retinols that we just spoke about, vitamin C, niacinamide, caffeine, hyaluronic acid, and different molecules that really have powerful benefits to the skin. I tend to think that if you stick with the bigger name brands that we know, that tends, I like that better because I know that most of their work is going into product development, not so much into packaging, and they have in my view, better quality control, and that's a great place to start, and they're often at the best prices. And then you have to see what works for your skin. A lot of times, patients come in with bags of products, and they just buy based on what's on the label. 
and that goes with the line that if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And you know, they know how to get you with with labels and and names. Be a little bit careful there, and, and have a, a a good sense of of skepticism about some things. But I do like serums. I find that serums are designed to deliver actives and and in a very concentrated way. So I do like serums. The eye area, to answer that part of your question, is a very delicate area, and it is different than the skin on the rest of your face. It doesn't always, you know, if you're if you're young and you're otherwise your skin is healthy, you don't necessarily need a separate eye cream. But if you have a certain problem with your eyes and that you're trying to treat dark circles or redness or puffiness, there are eye creams that are designed and tested for that area. And many eye creams are also designed and tested not to sting your eyes if it gets in your eyes. They actually test for that. Um, and it's tested to be used in that area. So if you have sensitive eyes or if you have specific problems, then you may want to use an eye cream. But for general skin that's otherwise healthy, typically what you use on your face can be used on your eyes as well. Okay, that's helpful. Um, we probably have time for maybe one more quick question okay. and then, and then we'll so have fast. to wrap it up. <laughs> yeah. Um, two questions? Okay. Right. Two questions left um, that we're going to answer. So one is from Karina, and she asked, what are your thoughts about SPF with hyaluronic acid? I like it. I love hyaluronic acid. It's natural to the skin. I inject it all day long as a dermatologist to help plump the skin. If you apply hyaluronic acid to the skin, what it's doing is it's working as a humectant, which means it's locking water in the skin, it's pulling water in, it's keeping your skin hydrated, but it's not usually particularly heavy or occlusive. And that makes it a great way to moisturize or hydrate without really being occlusive. And if it's in with an SPF, that makes it, that, that works just fine too. As long as that SPF has a number 30 or higher, just to throw that in there again, then, then you're okay. So yeah, I, I, I don't mind those products. I like them too. Okay. And then um, L, L, I think I asked, um, would you recommend any topical antioxidants? I mentioned some like vitamin C, vitamin A is a topical antioxidant. Peptides are really great as well. There's lots of interesting ones that are botanicals, but that brings me to a point which I think if I could just say for one minute, which is really important, that you know, having done a lot of product testing, I get these ingredients that I see in these products and I look at them on paper and I go, oh my God, look at this ingredient list. It's got resveratrol and hyaluronic acid and, and niacinamide, caffeine, peptides, all these great antioxidants marine extracts, so many great things. And then I try the product and it's irritating, it's sticky, it's occlusive, it feels horrible on my skin. So there's two components of any product that you get. One is the actives, which is really important. The other is the vehicle, what the actives are in. That vehicle, that inactive component is really as important as any active ingredient in the product because that's what can help it penetrate the skin better. That's what can make it feel good to apply and comfortable on the skin. Those formulations are really difficult and complicated. They're not interchangeable. So if you see something that just says retinol or just says um, hyaluronic acid or has a list of ingredients that you like, that alone isn't enough. It's how you put it together. And the analogy is always about making a cake, right? So you give somebody sugar, eggs, flour, and some butter, and you give it to a master chef. I bet you that one's going to taste a bit better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you want someone who's a master at creating these, and you want a, a formulation that has data, that has testing, that has safety and efficacy all built in. And that's what I look for when I recommend products to my patients. Great. Well, I think that that's all we're going to have time for today, but we really appreciate everybody who was watching and all the great questions. Um, before we go, I want to say thank you so much for being here. And if you want to end with a few, you know, highlight, highlight the top tips again, that would be great. And then we can sign off. Well, I would, I would really love one thing I find when I look at anybody or when I'm out or when I look at my patients, the first thing I see is beauty. And so I would ask that on, on this day, you go look in the mirror and look at what you like best about yourself and think about how you wanna highlight and celebrate your best features and preserve and continue to enhance them. Do things like, um, if you think you have a pimple that is outstanding and bothering you, try to highlight another area and distract away from it instead of fighting with it. Wear sunscreen to protect and preserve your skin on a daily basis. Try to be sun smart. Try to be indoors in the middle of the day. 
um, have your best activities early and late when you can. Seek shade when you can, wear a hat, wear sunglasses, big sunglasses, a hat with a big brim, look for sun protective clothing, make sure you apply enough SPF and reapply it regularly so you get that adequate protection because it's so much easier to prevent the damage than it is to fix it later. See your dermatologist on a regular basis to make sure that your skin is otherwise healthy. Sometimes people notice spots and it brings them in and those spots are fine, but I see other spots that I can point out to them that we need to watch or maybe even remove. Your dermatologist is your best guide and make sure they're a board certified dermatologist, ideally an AAD member. And you can go to the AAD website to find dermatologists near you to have an annual skin cancer screening, take pictures or make lists of the products you're using so they can help guide you through the ones that are best for your skin, for face and body. And the neck and chest age faster than the face, scar more easily, heal more poorly and are harder to fix. So make sure you cover this area really well when you apply sunscreen and do it every day, all year round. Thank you. Thank you so much. And just um, to add, the, the AAD website is aad.org. Thank you again for watching and mm -hmm. thank you again to Dr. Day. That's been so much fun. <clears throat>